Amen. Good morning, real life. A couple of you guys are awake. Well, my name is Michael. I'm so excited to be here with you. Richie was originally scheduled to preach this morning, but uh, he had a great opportunity, a church that, um, that we are in partnership with that actually about 10 months ago gave financially to help uh, us launch here. They're going through a little bit of transition period where they asked if we could help. And so Richie and one of our elders hopped on a plane and are down there this uh, weekend in Florida. And I just love when Jesus's church acts like Jesus's church, where we can support one another. I think we met them through a conference of like a network conference. And when they heard just a little glimpse of what we were thinking God wanted us to do on the South Hill, they said, we're in. We don't know where Spokane is in the South. We wouldn't even know what that means, but we're in. If you guys are going to reach the world for Jesus one person at a time there, we're in. And so we just love this opportunity that we have uh, this weekend to, man, to be able to give back and to encourage them. And so I just love that Richie has the opportunity to be there. And I'm excited that I get to share with you this morning. We're continuing in our series, Spark Start Fires. And today we're going to look at, man, what it, how, how and what does it look like to respond in a way that brings life, speaks life, encouragement when you're being attacked? So when someone's speaking negatively against you, your character, how do we respond in a way that honors God and actually helps move the mission forward? And so I don't know about you, uh, but how many of us in the room have ever been on the verbal, like the end of, the, of a verbal barrage before and just felt blown up? Okay, most of you. The rest of you, maybe by the end of this talk, you'll feel that same way. Um, just joking. But, you know, the, I think when we're growing up, we... We get taught a couple of different ways to respond to that. You know, we get taught to uh, just kind of roll with it. Like, it doesn't matter. You know, we hear the sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me thing. Just let it roll off. That's a lie. And words hurt. Then we also hear the other one, the one that I tend to uh, subscribe to is, you know, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say to me bounces off me, sticks to you. You guys never heard that? No, just a Southern California thing? Okay. Um, we're weird down there. We've got sun, sun year-round. We've got the ocean. It's beautiful. It's weird. Um, so I, I subscribe to that one. You know, when someone says, hey, uh, you're kind of acting like an idiot. You're acting like an idiot. <laughs> and then it usually dissolves the situation, right? <laughs> Actually, it gets worse and worse and just adds fuel to that fire, and then we're sparking, you know. And so I'm just excited because I think... You know, every every time I'm thinking about this conversation, I think of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, imitate me, church, as I imitate Christ. And so today, I would love to look at a couple different examples of how Jesus responded when he came under attack. You know, his character was put on trial, so to speak. And I'd love to glean some of those information if, man, man, how can we apply that to our lives? Um, And so we're going to be jumping into John chapter 18. Uh, It's the fourth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And to bring some context to where we're at is this is right after he was gathered with his disciples. So the the part we just did, communion, this is right after that. So I just want to give you a mindset of where Jesus' heart and mind may be. Jesus wasn't immune to feelings. He was 100% man, 100% God. But his man... He felt, you know, he felt emotions. You know, he, he uh, experienced excitement, joy, loss, um, sorrow. And this is the moment right after he was betrayed by one of his closest. And he was taken and, and run off to, you know, in, in shackles to the high priest. And so I just want to get you that kind of context so you know that everything's not perfect in Jesus' world right now. He's kind of going through it. So I want to set that stage. And we're going to jump into John 18. And uh, so they bring him in front of the the priests. And so it says in verse 19, Inside, the high priest began asking Jesus about his followers and what he'd been teaching them. Jesus replied, Everyone knows what I teach. I have preached regularly in the synagogues and in the temple where the people gather. I have not spoken in secret. Why are you asking me this question? Ask those who heard. They know what I've said. Then one of the temple guards who was standing nearby slapped Jesus across the face. Is that the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? Jesus replied, if I said anything wrong, you must prove it. But if I am speaking the truth, why are you beating me? 
I'm going to pause there for a second. I, I love this picture of, of Jesus. He's just betrayed. He's just brought before the religious leaders. And they start grilling him about what he's saying to people. What is he stirring up? What is he, what is he preaching? What is he believing? And what is he sharing? And I love Jesus' response. It's not to go on the defensive and start attacking their shortcomings, their lack of faith, them missing out on the fact that he is the Messiah. What he does, he, he speaks of integrity. He goes, I'm not hiding anything. You can ask anyone. I've shared openly what I'm about and what I feel God has asked me to share. And so I think of that as, man, one of our first ways to combat the negative attacks against us is, man, to be honest about where you're at in life. None of us are perfect, but I think one of my biggest uh, defense mechanisms when someone asks me a question, I immediately start building walls and start firing you know, retaliatory strikes against them. I do. It's like, wait, why are you asking me this? I think you're in sin, so you got to tell me what's going on in your life, and then maybe I'll open up. No, I go, I go defensive. But Jesus doesn't do that. He just goes, hey, I, everything I've said has been open. Ask anybody. I have nothing to hide. And so I just love that, that he doesn't immediately start getting defensive. He just goes, man, ask anybody. And so the they get done with him, the religious leaders, and they have to bring him to Pilate because the Romans are the ones that can actually like authorize the crucifixion. The Jewish leaders can't. So they bring him before Pilate, and picking up in 33, it says, Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked. Jesus replied, is this your own question, or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate retorted. Your own people are leading, and, and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. So Pilate asked, so you are a king? Jesus responded, you say I am a king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is the truth. We've talked about it a couple of weeks ago about having that curiosity. And I love Jesus. Jesus is like a master Jedi. When anybody asks him a question, what's he do? He responds with a question. So are you the king of the Jews? Are you asking that question? Or is someone else asking you? you know, I love that he just flips it, and then he flips the whole thing on its side. He goes, my kingdom's not of this world. My kingdom's eternal. And I think for you and I to overcome some of these attacks, we have to have a mindset and a perspective that's more than just temporary. It has to be an eternal mindset, an eternal perspective. And I love that Jesus gives us this model of that. I love that, man, we look at him and we go, he knew exactly why he was here. He knew exactly why he was on earth. He came because the Father loved you and I so much. And because of our acts, our decision to disobey God and try to live our own life our own way, man, we were destined for destruction. But God loved us so much that he sent Jesus. And Jesus knew why he was on earth. He was on earth to fulfill God's plan to create a way that you and I could enter into relationship with God the Father again. And so he had this perspective that he wasn't going to get bound up in this little, like, discussion about kingdoms and this and that. He's like, no, 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 no. Mine's not even of this world. You know, I'm not going to get in an argument with you. I have higher things on my mind. I have a different purpose. And so for you and I, we have to figure out what is our higher perspective. You know, we as a church exist to reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. And we believe that God called us and created us to love him with everything we got and to love people with everything we got. Jesus himself said that he came to seek and save the lost. And he called and commanded us to make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything that he's taught and baptizing them. That is my higher perspective. That is our higher perspective. And so we have to wrap our mind around, is that true of me? Do I believe that God came to die for me? Do I believe, do I have, have I put my faith in him? Do I have a higher perspective? 
Or am I living for just right here and right now? Am I living just for the next paycheck, for the next promotion, for the next iPhone, for the next whatever? What is my perspective? Because I think that shifts everything. Um, an example, I was watching a, uh, a news conference this week. There's a fight coming up in a couple weeks. And so they had the two fighters up and the, the media was asking them questions. And one of the fighters just goes off, starts attacking the other guy, talking about how you've got a glass jaw. I'm just going to blow on you and you're going to break. And all of these things. And then he starts attacking his character. He starts attacking his father. He starts attacking his faith, just goes off on the guy. What he's trying to do is get inside his head psychologically, right, before the fight, break the guy before the fight happens. But what I love is the media's got going, oh, this is going to be good. So what do you have to say to that? And I love the other fighter's response. He goes, man, I'm so excited. I've been training so hard, and I can't wait for two weeks to show you guys how hard I've worked. I want to become that champion. I'm going to wear that belt. And they go, yeah, 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 great. So what about what he said about your dad? Man, I am so excited. I've been training my butt off for for months, and I can't wait to show you guys what I have been working towards, and in two weeks, I'm going to be that champ. Okay, but what what about what he said about your faith? Man, again, I'm just so excited. Do you see that that perspective shift? He had had his his goal in mind. He wasn't going to let anything distract him from what his prize was, and that's winning this fight in two weeks. He wasn't going to get into the squabble. He wasn't going to try to defend something he didn't need to defend. And so I think you and I need to have that understanding of what's, what are we focused on? What's our end game? I think that shifts a lot in this conversation. Because when someone starts chatting at you and, and, you know, attacking your character, you can spend a lot of energy Defending yourself, making yourself look better in front of other people, or you can spend your energy, man, focused on the kingdom and pointing people towards the king, pointing people towards the hope that you have in Jesus. And so I love that. Another example I see in Jesus is when he is at the synagogue and he sees a man with a deformed hand and uh, the Pharisees, the leaders, the religious leaders of the law come up to him and go, man, is it, uh, is it lawful for you to heal that guy on the Sabbath? And of course, Jedi Jesus goes, uh, let me ask you this. Who of you who has a sheep that fell in a well on the Sabbath would not go after it and rescue it? Of course you would. Of course you would go and rescue that sheep. So why is it any different that I would do good on the Sabbath? So he tells the guy, hey, stretch out your hand, and his hand is healed. And of course, these religious leaders get all upset, and they start to go off and plot on how they're going to kill Jesus. And I just love Jesus' heart here. Jesus is more focused on loving the people around him than what others have to say. He is more concerned about the people in his life. Like, these guys are more concerned about the law. Like, ooh, can God heal on the Sabbath? You know, oh no, God can't heal on the Sabbath. It's only Tuesday through Thursday he can heal. Fridays are for him just answering any request you have. No, like this is ridiculous. And so Jesus goes, I'm not, I'm not going to get into an argument about what the law says or doesn't say. I mean, I'm more concerned about this man being whole and receiving life than I am about this little law that we, us humans made up. And I think, so, you know, some of my responses, like when, when attacks come in, how are we going to respond? First, you know, we have to shift our perspective to eternal, but then we need to love through this. He could have immediately started berating and, and attacking these guys for their lack of faith and, and give a theological statement of why it's okay to, to heal on the Sabbath. Or he could just do it and show, man, this is what God does. This is, this is how you love somebody. You encourage them. You speak life to them. I was reading an article this week from Newsweek that, uh, man, it's, it was really hard for me to, to read, mostly because it starts off kind of bashing where I come from, San Diego. Uh, San Diego is leading the way in um, getting cities to adopt a law that says it's illegal to help homeless people. 
And the story goes on to share about how people are being hit with fines for dropping off food for homeless people. Uh, it even talks about a 14-year-old girl who was harassed by the police because she was bringing sack lunches to people in need. And um, I loved her response when they interviewed her. They said, man, um, I don't know about the law and all. I, don't, I didn't know that that was wrong, but I, I don't really care. These people are hungry. And this is how I'm going to love these people. I'm going to bring them sack lunches. And so she responded to the criticism, the, the attacks on her with love, just like Jesus did. She's more concerned about the people around him than these laws. I think there's only really one law that I would be super concerned about, and it's the law of gravity. Like if you jump, you're going to fall, and so be careful. But all the other stuff, man, if you're pursuing God, if you have this eternal mindset, they just got it in the back. Um, <laughs> If you have this eternal perspective and mindset, man, you can't walk past people who are dying and not feel anything. You can't. You can't. And so how are we going to respond when people attack? I think of, um, man, I think of, you know, the One Heart Center. We had people talk to us about moving into the One Heart Center in that neighborhood. That neighborhood's too far gone. There's no hope in that neighborhood. Why would you plant a church there? Several churches have tried and failed. Why would you do that? Well, for one, we have an eternal perspective. God loves those people. Just like he loves every one of us in this room. He loves them. He has a plan for them. And, man, if that's where our focus is, we have to respond in love. You know, we're going to go there. We're going to invest in this neighborhood. We're going to love these people. And I love that we get to, we get to rescue them. I mean, I think Brandon shared, um, you know, we rescue, we rescue them from sex trafficking, from drug trafficking. Or we could turn a blind eye and say, well, you're right. It is too much work. It's too hard. There might be laws against us handing out food to these people or helping these people or housing these people. Or we can be motivated by love. And we can outlove those critics. Uh, Jesus himself says, man, we need to bless those who curse us. Pray for those who hurt us. Again, he says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Don't try to out strike an attack. Don't be a doormat. But you don't have to return fire for fire. You know, some of those conversations, well, I didn't start the fight, but I'm going to end it. You don't have to have that mindset. That's not an eternal mindset. I, th I think we spend a lot of time wrestling and fighting and wasting so much energy, time, resources, defending ourselves, trying to make myself look better in front of other people, rather than having the heart of God to love those around us that he's placed there on purpose, to have this eternal mindset that we could walk in and see God move mountains. I think this is something that I've really wrestled with, um, and I shared probably couple months ago about some of my upbringing. Grew up in a broken home. My dad was a drug addict, alcoholic, abused my mom. Um, rough go. I've had the hardest time loving him because in many ways I can justify all of the attacks that I received from him growing up. I can justify being cold and distant. But if I say and believe that each and every one of us in the room has, man, God loves and has a plan for, my dad's not excluded from that. He can't be. If my eternal perspective is on, he's not excluded from that. And so I remember uh, right before we moved up here 10 years ago, he was in a car accident. It was a DUI. He was in a coma. Um, we hadn't spoken probably a couple years before that accident, but we were leaving town. And uh, he was in a coma, and so I, I went to the hospital, prayed for him, left. We moved up to Spokane. A couple months later, I found out he was out of the coma, so I started calling. Again, we haven't spoken in years, but I started calling, leaving voicemails. Hey, I heard you're, you're awake and alive. I'm, I'm so thankful. Know that I'm praying for you. And it wasn't for a couple of months that I got a phone call. It wasn't from my dad. It was from my other sister who my dad was speaking through. said, hey, dad says he's got about 60% of his brain functioning right now, but that's enough to know that he still hates you. Stop calling. 
So I have a choice here. I can go, well, yep. He deserves what, he, what, he, what he's sitting in. He can walk his way towards destruction all he wants. I don't care. I'm done. I did my good effort. Or, man, I had to really pray, and it took several years, if I'm being honest with you, of me wrestling with God. Because my mom died when I was younger, and I always wrestled that God took the wrong one. And through this process, I had to pray and really wrestle with my convictions. Do I believe that God has a plan and a purpose? Do I believe that God wants to seek and save all of the lost? Not just the ones that are fun, that will be good to come to church with and nice to, to sing songs with, but all of them, my dad. So I wrestled and I said, okay, well, God, you're gonna have to change this heart in me. You're gonna have to soften my heart. So I started praying, praying and praying. Our relationship, you know, I respected his no contact order, but I prayed for him. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago when I went back to San Diego, uh, the guy that raised me, the neighbor across the street that I shared about, he, he passed away. So I went down to be there with his family. With, and and uh, during that whole process, I found out that my dad, a couple of years prior, got out of prison. And the first place he went was to my neighbor, Dave. He said, I'm tired of living my life for myself. You seem to have something figured out. My dad accepted Jesus and has been faithfully going to that church ever since. And I say this to encourage you that, man, we can either be lost and have that fire of bitterness or frustration or anger or whatever because of words spoken to us. We can let those sit and linger, or we can give those things to God and let God work, do his work in us and through us. And I'm not the only one that was praying for my dad. I'm sure there were lots of people but it was so cool to see the faithfulness of God, that God rescued and redeemed my dad. And he and I still are on, on talking, on speaking terms. He is wrestling with a lot of guilt and shame for years of, of what we've gone through. And so now my heart is again praying for him to see that. So I think we could either respond with attacks or we can respond with love. And I say that, I share this with you because I know many of us are in this room and we have had advice given to us, words that were meant to be encouraging, but they felt like an attack. Hey, that brother of yours, they're lost. Stop, stop chasing them. That attic neighbor, man, there's no hope for them. Why are you wasting your time and energy on them? Those are words that are spoken trying to you know, help encourage us, but man, those are attacks because they're counter to what I believe and what we believe that God has. And so we need to counter those with love, respond with more love, more grace to those that are around us. I think of a couple of different things. So we need to have a right perspective, a kingdom mindset, an eternal kingdom mindset. We need to outlove those attacks that come in, bless those who curse us, pray for those. And then I think another one is, and we need to point to the fruit of what God is doing. Brandon talked about it last week. We looked at John the Baptist who's in prison and he's questioning, doubting his faith a little bit and he goes, man, is Jesus really the Messiah? Is Jesus really the Messiah? And when word comes to Jesus, what's Jesus' response? Is it this really long, well-articulated theological statement of how he is the Christ? No, he tells, he tells his disciples in Matthew, he says, go back to John and tell them what you've heard and what you've seen. The blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured. The deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And when those attacks come in and all seems lost, you point people to the fruit of what God is doing. I was talking with a buddy who, um, he has just celebrated one year of sobriety. And it was so amazing but he was receiving attacks at work. He was receiving attacks. Hey, you're no longer the fun guy that we used to go out and drink with. You're, you know, all this stuff. And he was feeling a little down. And I was like, and he was sharing with me, man, I've got so much to grow. And I go, yeah, but look what God is doing in your life. Point him, I pointed him to the fruit. I think of us as a church, there are critics of real life. And we can respond with, 
theological response. We can get, get really angry and, and push back at them, you know, because our music's too loud, or this is too that, or this isn't enough. Whatever the, the complaints are or accusations against us. And I just go, you know what? Look what Jesus is doing. Look at the 228 people who said yes to God in 2018 alone. That's not something I can manufacture. You can manufacture. Look at the fruit of what God is doing. We have this eternal perspective of his kingdom advancing on the South Hill of Spokane that we're 100% sold out to, seeing our neighbors come to know Jesus. We're so sold out to relational discipleship, not just coming to church, hearing a message, and being quote-unquote fed. Man, we're here to equip each and every one of us, to encourage each and every one of us to go and be the light in your neighborhood, in your family, to speak those, those words of encouragement, to bring life into those situations. Man, each of you is placed exactly where you're at on purpose. You're in the family you're, you're at on purpose. You're at the school you're at on purpose. You're in this room on purpose. God has a plan for you. Who in your life do you need to switch your perspective on and have more of a kingdom mindset? And you need to love and outlove their attacks when they push you away and say, you're just a silly Christian. Who do you need to pour into more and love them and encourage them? Who do you need to point the fruit out in your own life? When I went back to San Diego, you know, I was a youth pastor there for eight years, eight and a half years, but I was a kid to them. I grew up in the church. It was really cool for me to go back and for them to go, man, we see what Jesus has done in your life. And it wasn't about me. It was about what God has done. How many of us have things we've overcome that Jesus has helped us cross over, that Jesus has healed or rescued us from, that we're too ashamed to share? Because gosh, I don't want to share that God has given me two years of sobriety because then they'll know I was a drunk. When it's, man, it's the power of God's, man, God's fruit in our life that can change someone else's destiny. Someone else is struggling with a certain thing in their life. And when they hear, man, God is good. He is faithful. He rescued me from that. You know what that does inside of somebody? It gives them hope where they didn't have hope. It gives them life where they thought was only death. I think so many of us think we're doing this alone. We're isolated. We think we're the only ones that struggle with this, that, and the other thing. Those are attacks from the enemy. Man, we need to lift our eyes off of ourselves. We need to place them on the author and perfecter of our faith. That's Jesus. We need to love incredibly well. And we need to share what God is doing. Not for my glory, not for your glory, for his glory. Only God can save somebody. As we wrap up, I want to encourage each and every one of us, some of us in the room, and we need to say yes to God. We need to change our perspective. We need to stop chasing all of the temporary things and fix our eyes on eternity. So maybe you're in the room today and you're tired of living this life for yourself, the frustration, the lack of hope. Maybe you need to put Jesus in the center of your life and say yes to him for the first time. And we would love to help you take that next step and be baptized. Baptism is a beautiful picture. It's a picture of your old life being buried underwater, just like Jesus was buried in the grave. And just like Jesus rose from the dead, you come out of that water a new creation. Your old life is gone. I love that today we're gonna get to celebrate with a young man who's making that decision. I'm so excited. But if that's where you're at, then you can make that step today too. We have a team in the back that would love to pray with you, would love to help you process and take that next step. Many of us in the room, man, maybe we need prayer. We need prayer because we're hung up. We would rather win a fight than maintain a relationship and fight for relationship. We'd rather fight to win an argument. Maybe some of us are just weighed down by all of those things that have been spoken over us that aren't true. Maybe we need to be reminded of who we are We're going to have people in the back who want to pray with you. And I want to encourage you. I want 
encourage us, family. We are a family. Asking for prayer is not a sign of weakness. And it's a sign of being real and authentic. If you need prayer, do not leave today without being prayed for. You're not in this alone. And we are here doing this together. Let's be encouraged. Maybe you need your heart to be softened, like mine towards my dad. Maybe you need someone to pray that God would soften your heart. Let's stand as we're closing. I want to pray that God would take all of our eyes off of ourselves and that he'd help us see himself, his plan that he has for each of us. That we might see what he wants to do in us and through us. How he wants to impact our family members, our neighbors, our friends for Jesus. Let me pray. God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that you love us so much that you would send your son, Jesus, to live the life that we couldn't, to die the death that we should have, all so that we might have relationship with you. God, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you had an eternal perspective when you came, that you didn't just opt out, that you endured the cross, putting our sin and shame on yourself so that we might have life. We thank you for that. We pray that you'd give us that same mindset, that we would see this city, we would see our neighbors the way that you see them, that we would chase after them with a heart that responds to the attacks with love, with compassion, so we might be moved to pray for them, to point them towards you. And God, we pray for more fruit, that you'd, you'd do more work in our lives, God, that we might be able to point to you and say, this is, this is what our God can do. He can heal people. He can restore relationships. Our God is good. So God, we give you all the glory and honor and praise this morning. You are so worthy. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're getting baptized, head to the back. If you need prayer, there are people in the back that want to pray with you. The rest of us, let's engage in worship.